Good morning. It's six thirty. Four. Nearly five. <laughs> Sorry to be picky. Um, in fact, the more I talk about it, the more it's going to actually be 6.35. And you're watching uh, Breakfast here on GB News with me and Martin. Shall we bring you up to date with what's in the papers today? And the Sunday Times leads on Israel, as you can imagine, as hostages are dragged from their homes with families fleeing slaughter. And the Sunday People leads with Sakir Starmer's £1.5 billion plan to save the NHS. And the Sunday Express, meanwhile, is also focusing on Hamas terrorists who have kidnapped grandmas and children as hundreds were slaughtered in a brutal attack on Israel. And the Telegraph says Israel suffered a 9-11 moment when Hamas terrorists killed civilians. And so let's meet our headline makers today. Joining us to go through some of those headlines, at least, is the editor of Spike, Tom Slater, and author and journalist Susan Holder. And it's lovely to see you both. Good uh, OK, Susan, we're starting with Keir Starmer, who's going to save the NHS. Yes. How is he going to do this? Oh, well, single-handedly. <laughs> no, he's going to... His plan is... It's all about his... I, lovely idea that he got, goes on about quite a lot about taxing non-DOMs, mm. which um, apparently could bring in £3.2 billion. And he has a uh, £1.5 billion plan to salvage the ailing NHS. It doesn't talk about... I've, I've read this a couple of times to try and find out whether he says anything about what he's going to pay wages-wise mm. and, uh, and, and, and how he's going to settle that. And that isn't mentioned. Well, but apparently he's, they are going to do a lot more overtime, which that's doesn't right. seem to kind of be... I don't know whether that would be good news if you work in the NHS, that you'll just be... You know, you have a bit Required more money, to but you'll be very overtime. tired. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he, talk, he talks about generous overtime pay. So this... this basic Basically, mm. is more pay for doctors and nurses. We should expect from from a, a Labour prime minister. But I want to ask you about this thing, about, and ask you as well, Tom. This thing about taxing non-doms. Mm. Um, can you continually squeeze the pips out of the richest people, or do they just kind of clear off abroad? Well, it says here, and I don't know. How, researchers have calculated, in answer to your question, that less than 0.3 percent of those affected would leave the country, which is oh. fewer than 100. How they know that? Have they gone round all the non-doms and asked them to fill mm. a form in on that? that that's <laughs> got to be an estimate. Or, no, I, or shall I just use the word guess? That's yeah. got to be a guess, hasn't it? How would you know? Yeah, because how do you know what they're going to do right. in of response? Of course you don't. Yeah. But mm. that's what they're telling you in answer to your question, because obviously people have asked them that before. Yeah, and that's... So, Tom, yeah. throwing that to you, because it's a continual thing. We're going to tax the richest, we're going to tax non-doms, yeah. we're going to tax the energy companies. This is old-school-style high-tax socialism. They can't tax the public anymore. We've already got the highest taxes mm. since World War II. But will this work? Well, it's, it's so hard to tell because anything that presents itself as a kind of one factor, one policy solution is obviously going to be ridiculous. It has been interesting the extent to which um, the Shadow Health Secretary, West Streeting, has been talking about actual reform as well, not just talking about the money that's going into the NHS, but actually how services are delivered. And you do wonder if it would take a Labour government to grasp the nettle of NHS reform in a way that the Tory party couldn't because for so many years they just had to spend so much time, expend yeah. so much energy and breath talking about how the NHS is safe in their hands. Perhaps it would take a Labour government to um, reopen that debate about how we structure the NHS. He is talking that sort of NHS. language, he is. isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's saying it will die if it doesn't reform. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but he hasn't quite spelt out exactly how um, draconian those reforms might have to be. Quite, and, and deeply unpopular, no doubt, with parts of the world. Except workforce, that, as so. you put it, it's only the Labour Party, that, a Labour government that might be able to do it. Might be able to get away with it, as, as it were. We, yeah. we did, and what those reforms are, as you say, hasn't really been spelled out. Well, I think anyone but... who's had any experience of the NHS, and I, my, my mum broke her, um, her pelvis a couple of weeks ago, Ooh. Oh. and Ooh. any experience you have of the NHS now, I have to say, when it brings into very sharp relief, it is broken. There is no communication. Things are not mm -hmm. working at mm -hmm. all. So pouring money in is actually... It's just falling down some kind of cracks and not going where it... But we already yeah, pour money in, don't we? Exactly, that's yeah. what I mean. I mean so yeah. just doing more of that. It mm -hmm. does need... It seems to me that I think people are wising up mm. to the fact that reform is not the dirty word it used mm -hmm. to be, that, it, that then something you... is broken that needs fixing. That's right. If you go back to the Blair years, of course, Blair introduced this kind of, this kind of private, um, public co-option, yeah. um, which kind of gets airbrushed out of history. You know, Blair mm -hmm. was, was the moderniser there. Maybe Labour might do that again. Maybe the Tories can't privatise it because it's such a demonic thing to suggest. Well, there is that. I mean, there's already been some discussion around kind of Labour circles about using the private sector more. I mean, of course, a lot of those kind of PFI contracts turned out to be deeply controversial because they weren't delivering value for money in many situations. I think the problem is we've always kind of just ricocheted between should more should the taxpayer be footing more of the bill, should we be using more of the private yeah. sector? It does feel like a kind of deeper conversation needs to be had about just the way 
the NHS is structured, it's incredibly centralised, there's all these kinds of issues which many people have brought up, but you just hope that we could have that debate, because for so long, politicians are so terrified They're to touch terrified it. They're terrified of meddling, aren't they? Yeah. But it doesn't seem to me that pay, paying record amounts for overtime is necessarily what everyone wants no. to hear. I more don't know. money. Yeah. Yeah. And also squeezing the rich, in this case the non-doms, mm -hmm. for more and more tax. I mean, last time we did anything like that was probably in Harold Wilson's government when it caused a brain drain. Yeah. And if, remember? And it, well, it does... Get, and it, but also, if you're a non-dom and you've got that amount of money, you have very good accountants who can kind of work out ways mm -hmm. of kind of getting you out of this, that and the other, which is very annoying. But Although it's, it's, it's also is, a very neat way of getting it Rishi Sooner. It is. It's it's it, yeah. I think that's all it is, to be honest. <laughs> do you, do you really yeah, think so? I really do. No, I think you're dead right. If you think back to the Mick Jaggers, the, Mick Jaggers, the McCartneys, all the richest yeah. people left Britain just never go. came back. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, good luck with that. Uh, uh, let's talk about nurseries, Tom, mm -hmm. and the fact that um, we've got record number of nurseries shutting down. Yes, yeah, so um, the closures soared by 50% last year, um, which comes at the same time as the government had expanded, actually, the sort of nursery provision. Um, so you've got a situation where you've got parents and large groups of parents who are eligible for more free childcare, and yet at the same time they're going to struggle to find the places. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show that you, you can offer these programmes, and obviously they're very well needed, not least with people trying to get back to work, but at the same time, if you haven't got the provision there, then mm -hmm. again it's just it's a pointless exercise, essentially. And you've got Labour naturally on the... Um, as their conference gets underway, talking about how this is another damning indictment of the Conservatives, another pledge they haven't been able to deliver. And whilst we've heard that so many times over the course of the past couple of days, and we'll hear it so many times more. You can't help but feel that the Tories have given them a series of own goals on yeah, this yeah. kind of stuff. It makes you wonder how much of that is true, though, um, Suze, because, like, for example, David Cameron brought in vouchers for kids, and that's when I had my kids. Mm -hmm. And what happened then is, because everybody had vouchers, you couldn't get a place. No, exactly. No, it's like, it's like free school places, or you get, then you go and knock on the nursery door, and they say, well, sorry, we, yeah, uh, we, we, we don't have the staff, we can't yeah. take you in. Mm -hmm. it's, and it doesn't... It, it's, it's a lovely thing to write about, and mm -hmm. it's not a good thing to try and... Do you know, my access. heart absolutely breaks for particularly young mums, but young dads too, mm -hmm. obviously, yeah. Yeah. who want a family, uh, you know, and quite rightly too, but find it... The, the only way you can keep going at the moment is to have two incomes, really, yeah, isn't right. it? And you're right, though, it and, is and women to try who, and, yeah, who and are more affected. And to try and find a nursery place for your children yeah. at the moment also is either impossible, or if you do find it, horrendously expensive. And it, and, and, but you're right, on, it, on it, or all counts, I think it's women who are affected, because even if it's... Um, it, 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 because it tends to be the one who will step back from a career mm. to kind of facilitate the fact that, she, that there has to be more childcare mm -hmm. because you can't afford to put the childcare in so that you can... So it's your career that gets put to one side, well, but, but, generally but, speaking. But, but then, no one for the dads here, yeah. dads tend to work all the hours God yeah. sends to, yeah, yeah. to yeah. make ends meet and don't Absolutely. see the kids, don't so, the so kids, there's, no. there's give and take there. I Absolutely. don't know, but if anyone is watching at the moment and has got experience of this, love to hear from you. I mean, maybe you're already a bit like me, you're past that generation, but you must be looking in absolute angst at your own children, who are trying to have a family, yeah. Yeah. but well, cannot find a way to yeah. make it financially work. Or if your grandparents, you're stepping in and you're well, the yes. bridge. You're mm. the bridge, you're doing yeah. that childcare because it can't, that, that, because it's so unaffordable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get in touch with us, tell us your story, please do, gbviews at gbnews.com. Fascinating stuff. Granny daycare, yeah, we should have a bit more of that. Anyway, Susan, <laughs> we go to the next story, another one here. Government chiefs to crack down on sick notes culture. Yes, again. Well, which is a good idea because there is far too much of that. I think we've all kind of realised that for some reason since um, the pandemic, people aren't as keen to go back to work um, <laughs> as, as they ever were. Um, but this one is going to be... Um, it's planned for Jeremy Hunt's autumn statement, apparently, uh, this, um, this kind of new policy. And Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary, and Steve Barclay, the Health Secretary, are working on plans to kind of shake things up. Um, and, it, it, and it's saying here that apparently GPs tend to... Because of the pressure on them and you only get a few minutes to kind of state your case and... The, the quickest thing they do is agree, sign off, and nine out of ten people who go in and ask for a sick note get them. I've never asked for a sick note, so I don't know what mm. that no, would no, involve. No, no, and no, presumably no. now it's not no. just physical no. kind of no. thing. Have we all not done it? No, no. I haven't, yeah. no. So I've never gone in and asked for a sick note to be off work. I'm either just kind of ill and then get better, or mm -hmm. I've never asked for anything that I needed to kind of. It's because we tend that. to work in an industry where if you don't go to work, you don't earn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah. true. You don't turn up, <laughs> yeah. you don't get any yeah. money. But I have had stuff um, so, you know, as well, but I've never kind of gone, luckily for me, long term 
diagnostic. But obviously, it's not just physical, is it? It's mental health crisis yeah. as well. Yeah. And you're right, if you only get six or seven minutes with your GP, yeah. it's much easier for them. And I'm not suggesting they always take the easy way out, but obviously it's easier and quicker for them mm -hmm. to just say, all right, well, you obviously needed some time off work. He sort of rattled through. Tom, Tom is, the, is this just part of this kind of continuum? Jacob rees mogg you know, mm -hmm. cappuccino class, pyjama-wearing, civil <laughs> servant, that kind of, that kind of cliché. Is that true? And is, is that, are, there, are there any votes in this? Um, the, the difficulty is it's not the sort of thing that people get out of bed and go to the, the voting booth over, but it no. is a really profound social problem that we have such an enormous amount of people now who are existing on out-of-work benefits, disability benefits in particular, and the big growth area has been people who are being signed off of work, things like anxiety and yeah. so on. Yeah. Mm. So we're not talking about people who are severely right. disabled and things like that. There is obviously a, a problem, partly with mental health, but also partly with people feeling it increasingly difficult to be able to go back to work, to go back out into the world. We've definitely seen that rise since COVID. And if nothing else, that's just a tremendous waste of human potential. Work is incredibly positive. Mm -hmm. That's yes. why even people who have quite who might be disabled in some ways, it's often very positive to, for them to be able to work even to the extent that they can with the hours that they can on some part-time basis. Gets you out in society, gives you some self-confidence. All of these things are really important. So it's not a vote winner, but it is something which I think it's more is important a big than human cost. But that is what exactly. you're looking at. They're going, they, they should say it should be more of a sliding scale. So Yep. Perhaps you're not fully fit and perhaps you do need some, some, some time mm -hmm. off, but you don't need to be off work not doing anything. There should be some sort of kind of, well, you can have you know, a bit yeah. of time, but you need to kind of do a, perhaps part of the work. Great OK, stuff. well, it's exactly quarter to seven. Uh, if you've just joined us, here's a quick reminder of the top news stories this morning. Yeah, Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vows to take revenge against Hamas. Rishi Sunak says the UK government stands in full solidarity with Israel against the, quote, cowardly and depraved attack from the Palestinian militant group. The Labour conference kicks off in Liverpool. GB News will be there, of course, bringing you every twist and turn from Sir Keir Starmer's final conference, probably before the general election next year. And lick your lips, because today marks the 50th anniversary since the first commercial radio station launched in the Curry. I thought it was a Curry story, it's not, in the UK. <laughs> I'm just so excited about Curry. Not quite the we'll same. be celebrating the milestone during today's show. Can you remember when you first listened to a commercial radio breakfast station? Let us know. It's an interesting one. What was the first ever commercial radio station in this country? 50 years ago. No idea. What do you think? The first the ever first first we're, not, we're not talking radio. radio. Luxembourg, no, no because that, it, it, that was, it was the first one no, to have... They not. were pirates and they were offshore. Yeah. So it was the first official licence given to a commercial radio station yeah. in this country oh. 50 years ago today. And it wasn't any of the offshore boys. It was no. London-based, as a clue. Oh, I can't believe you can't get it. You've probably worked for it at some point. <laughs> yeah. It's LBC. Oh. Yeah. Mm. And then the next day, apparently, was Capital. That's right. Oh, really? yeah. Both, yeah. both in London, came straight out. And ever since, here we are. And yeah. we, we also have a commercial radio course. If you listen on GB News Radio, thank you very much. OK, the next question is then, who is in the line-up, I wonder? See, I don't know that level of No, I don't, know, I don't know we that. We can find either. that out. Yeah. I've definitely worked for them, but not 50 years see, ago. If you'd ask me the first record that was played on Radio 1, I've always known that. What is that, it? Oh, what's that? I think that was Roy Wood and um, Flowers in the Rain, I think. It was. Oh, oh, that beautiful. was lovely, yeah. too. Right, that's, that's a random fact I do know. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I, really I didn't like know the random that. fact you were actually asking me. <laughs> OK, I think we've got to... Let, let's have a look another, at another newspaper story. Where have we got to? We've got to uh, um, OHS 2. Mm. So this is uh, industry figures talking about the thousands of jobs um, which now won't materialise as a consequence of Rishi Sunak axing the northern leg. So when construction between Birmingham and Crewe was due to take place at its height, it should have employed 6,500 people. And then when we're talking about the Crewe to Manchester line, even more, 17,500 jobs. And just a bit of a reminder that as much of HS2 became a money pit and a bit of a white elephant and all these sorts of things... Sort of. ..is that when you put all these big infrastructure projects in place, obviously they have all of these other benefits. And this isn't just the big um, companies which are laying track and employing thousands of people, obviously in the supply chain, all these small businesses and so on. So aside from anything else, you had whole areas of the country which were expecting this kind of inflow of cash and activity, which is now no longer going to be there. So whilst um, obviously many people feel like we've reached the end of the line, so to speak, with HS2, <laughs> mm. it's still the fact that for years and years and years this, was supposed, this sort of stimulus was supposed to be coming now isn't, and that is something which is going to... Um, yeah. I wonder, though, Suze, if, if people are going to get their 
small violins out for the people who won't get jobs building something that's going to cost the rest of us 100 billion yeah, quid. No, absolutely. And presumably there will be work doing all those other things that they've come up with that they should have come up Across with in the, the first place to go left to right yeah. and to kind of... You know, obviously, anyone, again, who's travelled on any train knows that there's an awful lot of work that could be done there mm -hmm. and I can't see why you can't redeploy those kind of people mm -hmm. into those, those areas where the building works. I also read, I think, in the same article that it says that because you, we are going to get that train going to Manchester but on the old line and it's actually be, it'll actually now be slower than it already is. <laughs> I, I can't believe how much of a mess they've made of it. I just no. can't. But that's why I have so little confidence for any of the kind of east-west I know, problems. yeah. Because so, yeah. HS2, I mean, many people have decided it's very flawed and so on. I mean, I prefer we didn't get in a situation where it was either or, that we could actually yeah. build things. But just the incredible expense that we have, which far outstrips what it's like even in kind of France and in Spain, the, the amount it costs us per mile of track yeah. to lay things is so ridiculous. You just think we're incapable of building anything. And, right, and so if you were Prime Minister, would you continue it or axe it? I would have continued with it just because I think we need really? uh, high-speed rail. It's just, uh, but at the same time, that has to go alongside with trying to find out a way to reform planning laws, to get rid of all of this ridiculous kind of obstructionism which takes place. But you place would take that big, brave decision to go ahead with it. What about you, Susan? I would have axed it. Oh. But, but also what I would do, I would go back to putting money into the... the I, I would leave the ticket offices open, I would pick more, put more, more, mon, more people on the trains, yeah. I would bring back the woman with the trolley who get, gives you a sandwich and a cup of tea. I think we should go back to being <laughs> British yeah. about yeah. trains. Yeah. and actually do that kind of thing and, and make it a joy to travel and in a way that we, we've lost. And it's interesting, Suze, you're a black country lass. I am. Um, I campaigned across the black country on this issue um, for, for many, many months. I didn't meet a single voter that wanted HS2. No. I met a lot of people who worked in the industry who yeah. wanted it. You're These <laughs> are the people crying today. And you'll find a lot of people in, in the Birmingham area who have had their, their not just their, their homes and their lives, but their businesses decimated yeah. mm. by the compulsory purchase. And can I just say, I saw a tweet yesterday saying that um, I live in Cheshire, uh, that, that we actually uh, were, were going to be compulsory purchased at our house. Uh, really? Uh, not true. No, no, no idea where that's come from, but people just make up all sorts of rubbish, don't yeah. they? Um, that, that, we, uh, that, yeah, we, we, that I object to it because our house is going to be compulsory purchased. Well, if it was, nobody ever told me. Yeah. So, um, I don't do you generally do well no. if your house is compulsorily well, purchased? Well, John Bishop did. I know that John Bishop was in Cheshire and he made a, a complete killing on the fact that... But a lot of people had to, obviously, mm. were not paid the value of their houses mm. and had to... And, 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 and yeah, and it's made a, a huge, huge problem for people who've lost their homes and businesses and will never get that kind of... And I think, back. quite scandalously, the day before Rishi Sunak made the announcement that he was going to axe the, of the, the, the line going up to Manchester, they still compulsorily purchased somebody's house really? for one and a half million mm. the day before. And, he, and we all knew he was about to take this decision yes. yes. as well. I mean, he been pretty clear on HS2 since he was even Chancellor. He just yeah. couldn't make that decision himself. So to allow that to go ahead just because you're waiting for a few days because you want to say it at conference rather than it just get out in the newspapers is, is genuinely out. Totally agree. OK, do we have time for one more? I yes, think we, we do. do. Suze, let's go to the Observer. Um, another school story. Children under five yes. excluded from schools. What's going on? Well, yeah, um, it's very strange. I mean, uh, they don't quite say why the children are being excluded Presumably, it is down to behavioural issues. But the, the biggest kind of shock and the reason why that has come about is that so many children are arriving at school, apparently, uh, not being able to... Uh, not being potty trained, not uh, language um, very poor. And, and obviously, that then, they're not able to cope in an environment where they are... You know, there is a level of expectation of what your child... So they, they are doing. then excluded at the grand old age of five or yes, something? Yes, yeah. exactly. Isn't um, but they spoke to one, um, one head of one school who had 70 children in reception, 30 were not potty trained. And, and I can... I think I talk about this probably we too do. often. Yes, we but but my missus is, is a TA. She works at nursery level and she deals with this on a day-in, day-out basis. And it's absolutely true yeah, yeah. that there are rocketing numbers of kids. They have a home visit, they interview the parents. Is your child potty trained? Yes, madam. Yes. They come to school, they're not. They're in a nappy. And teachers spend hours and hours cleaning up kids yeah. and being their surrogate mothers. Yeah. And when they phone home, they say, well, I can't, I can't come and get my kid. And they're dumped on, on, on the teachers. You know, this is a real thing. Yeah. And I think we've, got, we've had a real slip in parenting standards. If what, this... But what do you do about that? Well, <laughs> well, what you shouldn't be doing is, is axing as many Sure Start centres as no. have been done. We've yeah. lost like, over a 1,000 recently. And those kind of you know, units where you can go for help and advice on, on family, it is difficult having a child suddenly thrust into your life and, and bring it... They don't do enough kind of... Prepare, 
no one prepares you for that in school or, yeah. you know, they just expect you to just grow up and to you know. do these things. Yeah. And I know everybody kind of, you know, should kind of get on board with that. But at the same time, there are, there are key skills that are being lost. And if you haven't been brought up in a way that you've, yeah. you've learnt those skills, then you just kind of perpetuate the same problem. Because one of them this week, Tom, was the Labour Party going to teach kids how to brush their teeth you exactly. mm. at school because they're, t they're turning... And it's interesting that it's really divided the nation. Like, you and I were quite supportive, weren't we? Because... Well, I just think something's got to be done yeah. about the teeth of the nation. Well, yeah. I'm sure that people used to come into our school and they used to put their... They did. Dye in the yeah, they did. That's right, yeah. the dye, yes. yeah, and, when, and things went Plank blue. Dye. and so, You know, once a, you know, a year you'd have that. But you, I, I think that's you what... It. If that's what they mean, then that's absolutely... Mm. Fine. But you shouldn't have somebody standing over you making you brush your teeth every morning. Well, maybe, like, maybe into... things have come to this. Yeah. Maybe that's how it is. Maybe, maybe it is. Can I just tell you, we, we, we were talking about LBC being the first commercial <laughs> radio station exactly 50 years ago. Who started off their breakfast programme? A guy called David Jessel. He left the BBC temporarily, apparently, um, and he was the first guy on LBC in the morning saying, welcome to the first, you know, commercial radio station here in the country. He's now 78. I mean, I suppose 50 years ago he would Still be, going. wouldn't he? He went back to the BBC and made documentaries and things like that. So there you are. It was David Jessel. Mm, it's not a household name anymore, no. but presumably was very much then. We'll be talking about that a bit later on in the programme as well, the fact that it's 50 years ago today that uh, we had the first commercial radio station in this country, followed by Capital, as you said, yeah, and the next day. And this 25th curry week. I was getting excited about that <laughs> earlier. You were. Fact, you were licking your lips from You were getting your tooth <laughs> <was conflated>. Yeah. <laughs> never mind, never mind. We'll forgive you that. Yeah. But it is the end of National Curry Week today. So we were wondering if you were going to give up a British roast today and actually instead have, well, what's vast fast becoming, actually, yeah. the British uh, main meal, You were meal, talking about having, yeah. having curry for breakfast, weren't you? Yeah. Well, my husband, every time we have a takeaway, we'll save some because he prefers it for breakfast cold, cold in the, the morning. Day. <laughs> Quite the agree breakfast with you. of champions. Dreadful business. Shall we catch up with today's weather? Hello there. Very good morning. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather.